right, hello everybody and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. I'm Andrea and I'll be your host today. If you're not familiar with what we do here, we bring science, exploration and conservation into classrooms all around the world via virtual field trips. We typically run between 30 to 50 live events a month, so definitely check back in to see if there's any others that interest you. So today we have a super cool event. We're being joined by Darcy McNichol, who works with Fisheries and Oceans Canada at the Aquatic Institute in Winnipeg. So Darcy works very closely with Indigenous communities in Canada's Arctic and is interested in the changing coastal ecosystems there. Her research is super important as it helps inform best management practices for fisheries. So without further ado, welcome in Darcy. We're excited to have you. Hello, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So I've prepared a quick presentation and I wanted to show and highlight uh, some of the relationships I've been able to make up in the Arctic. Uh, the Canadian Arctic is so big and working closely with our Indigenous partners and our Inuit partners is instrumental to getting science done in the North. So I'm going to get my presentation up. And here we go. Uh, so I'm here today to present a quick presentation and a short video about community-based research in the Canadian Arctic. So I'm originally from Vancouver. I'm from the coast, West Coast, and I started getting interested in marine biology very early on. And now I get to do that as a job. I get to go explore the Arctic and see what species of fish there are and how they live in that habitat. But one of the most frequent questions I get asked is, why would you move from the ocean to the middle of the country to do marine biology? Well, in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, where I live now, uh, this is the headquarters for Arctic research. So the Canadian Arctic, because it's so big, this is the center of the country and it allows us to travel all over the Nunavut and the Northwest Territories to a whole bunch of different communities and work with the people there to look at how the Arctic is changing. So I've got little yellow stars in some of the places that we work this year and in previous years. And we work closely with fishermen and hunters and Inuit in those communities, as well as all along the Mackenzie River. So being in Manitoba in the center of the country makes it easier for us to start to see all of these changes and work with all of these people. So working with Inuit and Northern communities, why is it so important? Why is it so important that we work with our Indigenous partners? And Indigenous is another word for people who've always been there. And it's important because they have the best idea of what's changing and how quickly. They're the ones living in the Arctic, all their families are from these small communities and they've lived out on the tundra for many, many generations. And they're the ones most affected by the, the climate warming up. And they're the ones who have the best idea on what research questions that we should be asking as scientists. Some, some of the things they ask are, oh, the color of the fish that we used to eat is changing and the ice is gone faster than it used to be. And we can work directly with them to come up with the most important things that we should be studying. And because we work with so many communities all across the Arctic, it allows us to study the whole Arctic and get a really good big picture of what's changing and why. So for fisheries work and for some of the work that we do, uh, we work directly with people who catch all of their their food from the land and they go out hunting and fishing. And this is called subsistence. This means that they go out onto the land and out into the Arctic and they all the food that they eat, they catch from the area around them. So they're directly impacted by the, the Canadian Arctic changing and the climate warming up. And by working with them, we can collect samples from the food that they're eating in order to study how it's changing and how healthy the organisms are. So we work with people who harvest beluga, uh, who harvest caribou, seals, and for my work, uh, we specifically work with people who catch fish, like Arctic char. So there's two parts of the program that I'm involved in. Uh, the first one I'm gonna 
talk about is called Arctic Coast, and it's a community-based program where we work with coastal communities in the Arctic. So I've got a picture of our group here in a community called Iglulik from earlier this February. It's very cold at this time of the year. It was minus 50 degrees Celsius, and we wouldn't know how to drill through the ice or how to look at what the habitat is like in the winter without the help of the Inuit people that live there. So when we work in the summer and the winter in these communities, uh, what are some of the questions we ask? Uh, we drill holes in the ice and we look under the water and we wanna know what the habitat looks like for the fish there. A lot of these places haven't been studied before. So just understanding what the temperature of the water is and what the seafloor looks like is all really important information that we wanna find out that the Inuit are helping us do. So we've got a little bottom video camera there that we're lowering through the ice and we've got work that's done in the summer where the people in the communities go and record temperature and depth and samples from the bottom. When we get our samples from the sea floor, we want to know what lives in the mud. Is there food there that could be used by the fish? Is there a lot of different species? And what does that mean for the health of the ecosystem? So we have people in the, the north pull up these balls of mud, they dig through the mud and then they can find little clams that might be eaten by fish. Sometimes there's little sea cucumbers that have never been found there before and all kinds of different invertebrates that are all really important to document the different species that can be found in the Arctic because a lot of these places haven't been explored before for bottom, bottom habitat and bottom sources of food for the fish. When it comes to the fish, we want to know what species are there and how many of those species are present. Uh, sometimes some of the communities, they only ever try to catch char. And so we want to know all the other species that could be around and if there are new species that are showing up that haven't been there before. And with those fish, we, uh, we dissect them and we look in their stomachs and we want to know what they eat and is what they're eating changing as the Arctic warms up? Is there new food available for them or is the food that they used to eat slowly going away with the climate warming up? And so this brings into our cycle, these uh, questions that we're trying to answer when we go out to these coastal communities. We're trying to circle through uh, this, this thought process that the sea ice is melting and this is having an impact on the habitat. And this causes changes to the seasons. Uh, spring is coming earlier in the Arctic and the winter is taking longer to freeze up and have the full ice that there used to be. And this causes the food that the fish used to eat to move around. Uh, it's not always in the same place and at the same time anymore. And so this changes where the fish move and how they interact for each with each other. The biggest thing that we're looking at right now is that there's fish from the southern parts of Canada moving up into the Arctic because it's getting colder. And so the fish that are moving in could be competing with the ones that are already there for food. Which brings me into the next part of the research that we do is studying salmon that are doing this. They are moving from the southern parts of Canada up into the Canadian Arctic. And a lot of the people we work with are worried that the salmon are gonna compete and eat the same food that the fish that they already catch do. So in order to study this, uh, these salmon coming in, uh, the Arctic is so big and we can't be everywhere at once. So we work with the people who catch fish all over the Northwest Territories in Nunavut by giving them a gift card every time they catch a salmon. So there's salmon showing up in Nunavut, on Baffin Island, all along the Mackenzie River. And every time a harvester catches a salmon by accident, we offer them a grocery gift card and then we get the salmon and we can take samples from it. We can find out what they're eating and whether or not the salmon that are coming in could be competing with the char and the whitefish that they normally catch. So I've got a picture from last year in Tuktoyaktuk in the Northwest Territories where I collected some salmon from a local fisherman and then another picture of a harvester in the Klavik Northwest Territories who got a nice stack of gift cards from all the salmon he caught that day. 
And so I have a map here of the Northwest Territories and it shows all the different communities that we're collecting salmon from. And every year we're getting more and more. And this is likely because the temperature is warming up. There's more salmon showing up because the water isn't freezing, because salmon don't like ice. And they can go farther and farther and there's more of them showing up. So we don't know for sure yet where they're coming from, but we all the samples that we collect help us answer that question. Another part of our job that's very important is to meet and consult with all the different communities we work with because they're the ones who have the greatest concern for the land and what all these species mean. So we host a lot of meetings where we talk with the fishermen, we talk with the different councils in the, in the Nunavut territory and in the Northwest territories to show the research that we're collecting and also gather questions that they're having. They're the ones who are very concerned about salmon and so that's part of the reason why we do this project is because they are worried about their native fish and what salmon means for them coming in. So a big part of our job is traveling up into these communities and meeting directly with the harvesters to help design our research. And it's a big job. There's a lot of salmon that come in, a lot of different samples. And so we train a lot of the youth and a lot of the people up in the Northwest Territories to help us collect the samples. And then they have experience to work on, on future projects in science and design their own research projects projects as a result. So here's a picture of me with two guys from the Northwest Territories, uh, Gordon and Andrew from Aklavik and Tuktoyaktuk. They got to come to our lab in Winnipeg and help learn how to process the salmon and collect samples. But sometimes we're not able to travel. This year, because of COVID, we couldn't leave our houses. So we set up video cameras and we did remote uh, training so that people could collect salmon data and salmon information without having to travel. So this is becoming more and more important uh, as uh, restrictions come or unforeseen things prevent us from meeting with the community. So if you are interested in our Arctic Salmon project and uh, want to see the research we're doing, we have a Facebook page where we post pictures of people who've caught salmon and some of our research updates. So if you'd like to follow some of our work, feel free to like us on Facebook. And more recently, we also have an Instagram page because we travel to all of these amazing places and there's all this wonderful work. Uh, it's nice to showcase some of the pictures that we're able to take. And so with the changing Arctic, the Arctic is warming up. There's less and less ice and it's changing very fast. Uh, answering all of these big picture questions requires a really, really big team. Uh, there's a lot of people who are committed to studying fish and marine mammals and the ice uh, that come from science, that come from the communities, that come from uh, federal management, as well as universities. And it makes up a wonderful community of people studying and helping each other out, understanding the North. So this is a lot of big projects and I have lots and lots of people to thank all over the Northwest Territories in Nunavut. And I have to say thank you in a couple of their different dialects. Uh, thank you in English, Kuyanamik in Inuktitut, Kuyanaimi in Inuvialuktun, and Nakurmik in Nunaviktun. And with that, I can take questions, but I also have a video uh, to share at the end of this presentation. Do you want me to play the video now or after the questions? Um, maybe the video now. Uh, the right. video I put together from our field work at the beginning of this winter. So it's from January and February before we uh, weren't able to travel anymore. So it's all, all right. winter work. It's all from the very cold Nunavut Arctic. Awesome. I'll put that up now and then we'll take questions from our classrooms. Thank you.
right, awesome stuff. So we have a few questions from Ms. Whitmack's class. Uh, we have, what are the main concerns regarding the increasing salmon population? Uh, so the biggest concerns about salmon coming up into the Arctic uh, that we get are where are they coming from? Uh, so they, a lot of the people want to know if they're native to the Northwest Territories or if they're coming in from other places. And that's why we take a little DNA sample, a genetic sample from each of the fish, and we're able to find out where they come from. Some are coming from Russia, some are coming from the northern part of Russia, but some of the other species, they could be coming from Alaska, they could be coming from northern Asia, but uh, we work with a lot of people to answer that question and we do it with just a little piece of the fin. Um, the other question we often get is, will they eat the same food as Arctic char, as the fish that are native to the Arctic? So we are, I study that now by looking at fish diet, and we do that by looking at the muscle that the fish uh, come back with. So uh, we're able to answer those questions using the samples that we collect in our program. All right, interesting. So do our grade fours and fives from Canada, Ontario have any questions? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, we'll come back to you guys. Um, Mr. Coster's class, do you guys have any questions? Oh, okay. sorry. Yes, we do. Sorry. Go ahead, Emma. What is your favorite type of fish in the Arctic that you've seen, and uh, are they endangered, and how many are there left? Ooh, good, very good question. Thank you. Uh, I think my favorite fish is something called a wolf fish. It's a big eel-like fish that lives deep in the dark waters and they swim along the bottom and they've got extra rows of teeth and they're, they chomp around through the bottom of the, of the ocean and they get really big and they have beautiful spots all over them and they, they are rare, they're a species at risk. Um, so part of the work we do looking at habitat and where the wolf fish could live is important as far as choosing areas that they could be protected. So uh, there are wolf fish that I catch occasionally and I get very excited because they're, they're all a little bit scary and I'm a little bit scared to touch them because they chomp, but they're, I think they're beautiful. All right, um, we have another class joining us. Uh, where are you guys joining us from? Hello, welcome in. I think you might be muted. Hmm. I'm having trouble hearing you, but feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat and we'll answer those. All right, we have some more awesome questions. Lots coming in from Ms. Whitmax grade sevens. Uh, do you ever deal with narwhals is one. Uh, I don't specifically. Sometimes I see them. Uh, it's very exciting when you see the big tusk coming up out of the water while you're working. Uh, they're they're beautiful. They live in uh, off Baffin Island, most of them. And I work with people who study narwhals. So the information I get about the fish and where the fish are moving helps them understand how the narwhal might be responding and where the narwhal might be traveling. So even though I don't study them specifically, we all work together to try to answer all the pieces of the Arctic puzzle. And my piece is the fish piece. Super cool how interrelated it all is. Yeah. Uh, we have this question from Ms. Doyle's class. How often do you get frostbite? <laughs> I've never had frostbite. Um, it's another good thing about working with the Inuit is they know how to dress really well um, and how to prevent uh, getting too cold. And when it's that cold outside, like the video showed, uh, we're only out there for you know, maybe an hour tops when it's that cold outside and we have those shelters to stay out of the wind. But I've, I've never had frostbite and I hope never to have to have frostbite. <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah. Um, all right, let's see. I know we have other questions from Miss Whitmack's class. Um, what's the most exotic or unexpected fish that you found? Um, the most exotic fish? Uh, there is, there's one time I caught this thing called a lump sucker. It's about this big uh, and it looks like a little puffer fish and it has a suction cup on its belly and they stick to rocks on the bottom of the ocean floor and just sit there and eat food. 
Uh, they're normally found in the deep water, but they one of them was closer to shore one time. So uh, we pulled one up in our net and the local guy thought it was a puffer fish that would sting him, but they're not venomous. So I was excited because they're very cute and very, you know, they have their little suction cup. So I think that was the most exotic one I've caught was the lump sucker. All right. Uh, uh, Ms. Barbieri's class wants to know how deep the salmon can swim. So salmon actually don't go very deep themselves. They, in the water, in the seafloor, there's the top of the water and the bottom of the seafloor. They like to be in the middle. Uh, that's where all the food they like to eat is. So they don't sw swim very deep. Uh, they stay out in the middle of the water and then uh, they come into rivers when they're ready to spawn and lay their eggs. So they don't go very deep. Uh, they like to stay in slightly warmer water. All right, uh, Ms. DeCoster's class, do you have another question you'd like to ask? Uh, yes. Uh, Leroy, come here. What's the biggest salmon you guys have caught? Biggest one? Oh, uh, there was, there's a species of salmon called Chinook salmon. Uh, they're also known as King salmon in Alaska and they get to be very big. Uh, I got one that was the, the size of its head was the same size as my head. They, I have, yeah, it was huge. Uh, so it was probably a meter and a half long fish. He was massive. Uh, and I only got the head. I didn't get the whole fish itself. But based on the fact that its head was the same size as my head, it's a pretty big fish. Crazy. All right. Um, let's see. Do our grades four and fives have any questions yet? No, not again. <laughs> All right. Well, just make sure you're brainstorming. I'm sure you guys can come up with lots of awesome ones. Uh, we have this one from YouTube. Are there sharks in the Arctic? And if so, what are your favorite types? Ooh, that's a very good question. And a very, very timely one too, because uh, last year uh, I had a harvester contact me on the Facebook page and said, hey, like, what's this? Is this a shark? And they caught a salmon shark, which is normally only found in Alaska, all the way in Western Nunavut. So it was a same reason of the temperature warming up and salmon coming into the Arctic, this salmon shark might have followed that same water current and ended up all the way in Nunavut. So my favorite shark is the salmon shark uh, because only as of last year has it started to show up in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, there are Greenland sharks in the Eastern Arctic. Those are native and they have always lived in the Eastern Arctic around Greenland. And there is something called poor beagle sharks that are found in the North Atlantic, but in the Western Arctic, uh, there normally aren't sharks, but as of last year, they've started to show up because it's warming up. All right. Um, we have a few folks curious about what sort of schooling you have to do to get into this kind of work and how long does it take? Well, uh, I think if you have a strong interest in working with communities and working up in the Arctic, there are a lot of opportunities. It doesn't always have to be academia. You don't always have to uh, have a PhD or a master's degree. There's ways to be involved, uh, especially with uh, working with Indigenous partners that you don't have to go through years and years of school. Uh, but if you do want to be in academia and you want to be a scientific researcher, uh, I had to do a bachelor's degree. So I did a Bachelor of Science at University of British Columbia. And then uh, that was four years. And then three years after that, I did a master's degree here in Winnipeg. So uh, a, quite a few years if you want to be in science and do a scientific degree, but uh, you can still do research and be a part of all of it uh, without necessarily only being with a university. So it depends on what you want to do. And working with traditional knowledge, uh, I, I think it's just as valuable as scientific research. For sure. There's really endless possibilities in the sciences. I'm personally in my fifth year and I'm still figuring out all sorts of cool possible career paths. So. We have another question. If you found any new species during your research. New species. Um, I haven't identified any species that have never been found before, but I've found them in places that they haven't been caught. So the salmon shark was one that had never been 
recorded in Arctic Canada before that our work confirmed uh, was here in the coast. Uh, there were some wolf fish and some other small species of fish that lived in the kelp uh, that had never been recorded before that we captured. And uh, this past summer with our community uh, coastal work in Nunavut, they co collected some species that had never been caught that far north before. So even though these species have been found in other places, what they're doing in the Arctic and how they behave at that end of their their range is a really important work and it's going to help us understand and predict how things will change with the warming climate. All right, uh, we have this question from Ms. Barbieri's class. Uh, what do you find in the fish's stomachs? Ooh, that's my favorite thing to do is look through fish stomachs and see what they ate. Um, it depends. It depends on how big the fish is and how big the mouth of the fish is. If a fish has a big mouth, it can eat a lot of different things. Um, it can eat shrimp, clams, other fish, fish of the same species. You, you never really know. Uh, but if they're a smaller fish, I used to study uh, something called a capelin, which was really tiny. Uh, they would eat lots of zooplankton. And so you'd have to open their stomach and look under a microscope and you could count all the zooplankton that it ate. Uh, the salmon uh, are eating uh, small fish and small invertebrates as well and zooplankton. Um, but uh, because we study every type of species of fish in the coast, uh, they could be eating just about anything. So it's fun to see how they all differentiate from each other. All right, interesting. So our grade fours and fives have a question. Let's hear it, guys. How big is the salmon shark? Sorry, can you say it again? How big is the salmon shark? The salmon shark that the uh, harvester caught was six feet long. It was pretty big. All right, crazy. Uh, let's see. Does Mr. Yeah. Buster class have another question they'd like to ask? Yes. All right, Gage, come on. Come on. All right, come here. Say it nice and loud. How much fish do you get? How much fish do I get? Uh, well, because I work with. I work with. Sorry, say again. Sorry, say again. No, How go ahead. Get. How many fish do I How get? How many fish do I get? I uh -huh. get. Last year, I got almost two thousand five hundred salmon uh, from everybody turning them in for gift cards. So that was just salmon. That was just a salmon project. For the Arctic Coast project, the coastal research that we do, uh, we got, we try to get 30 of each species. So we got about 600 fish uh, in the summer this year. Uh, so lots, um, lots of fish. <laughs> that is quite a lot of fish. All right. Uh, Ms. Barbieri's class is curious about what color wolf fish are. Ooh, there's a couple of different species. Uh, some of them are brown with white stripes or brown with spots. Uh, there's another kind that's kind of a darkish blue color. And the one that I caught was more of a deep purple kind of kind of pinky, pinky looking color. All right. And we have this awesome question from YouTube. What is the scariest fish you found? Ooh. I'm a little bit scared of wolfish, to be honest. But they're, you know, they have that extra row of teeth, and they can really chomp if you're not watching. Um, it's probably wolfish. Uh, I've also caught some pretty big uh, Greenland halibut before, uh, and you know, if they're if they're really big, they can flop around, and they've got big teeth, so you got to watch out when you're trying to pick them up. So, yeah, halibut and wolfish. Fair enough. Uh... We have this question, do the fish have to be dead in order for you to collect the data? So not always. Um, uh, the ones that we look at their stomach and their muscle, uh, we, have to, we have to kill those in order to get those samples. Um, but we only get, we, once we have enough of a certain species, we can just um, measure them and then let them go. Uh, so we'll have the size information and where they were collected and the species they were, and then they can be let go. And that's what we like to do with the communities. So we're not killing any more fish than we need to. Uh, but with you know, getting genetic samples and diet samples and some of the things that we need to answer those big questions, uh, we need to subsample a couple of the fishes. All right, and sort of leading off of our wolf fish question, we have two of our classes asking, are there different types of salmon that you find? 
Yeah, very good question. Uh, so in the Pacific Ocean, there are five different kinds of salmon species. There is sockeye salmon, chum salmon, Chinook salmon, pink salmon, and uh, uh, coho salmon. And all five of those have started to show up in the Arctic. In the Eastern Arctic, it's mostly Atlantic salmon. So that's a six species of salmon. Uh, so in total, uh, six different salmon species, um, but there's five different kinds on the Western side. All right, interesting. So we have uh, this question sort of about the clothing to avoid frostbite that you answered before. What types of clothing do you wear to stay warm? And uh, do you get tips from the indigenous folks living there? Absolutely. Uh, so I wear the big Canada goose down parkas the, and snow pants that are also made out of Canada goose down. I have big heavy snow boots that I put little toe warmers in and big mitts. I usually walk around like a big penguin when it's that cold out. I don't, don't, you don't want to move too much either because if you start to sweat then you get colder. Uh, some of the tips I've gotten from the indigenous people are to take uh, beluga oil or seal oil that they cook with and you rub it in your hands and that keeps your hands warmer but it's really stinky so I don't like to do it. Um, and I also like to buy a lot of the sewing from the from the artists up in the north because they make great sealskin mitts and they use beaver and I I have sealskin mitts that I wear here in Winnipeg and my hands never get cold because it's it's perfect it was made just for this cold climates. All right uh, we have this one from YouTube have you ever found something that has shocked you that you were definitely not expecting to find? Mm. Um, yeah, there was, uh, it was last year, there was a wolf fish that was collected in the Western Arctic that had never been collected in that part of Canada before. Uh, I wasn't there at the time. This was uh, uh, my uh, community in Polytech. Uh, we had trained youth to set nets and I was in another community training someone else and they texted me a picture like, Darcy, what's this fish? And I'm like, oh, it's a wolf fish. <laughs> it's never been caught there before. And I was like, save it, save it, make sure you freeze it and collect samples. And they're like, oh, we already ate it. And I'm like, no, don't eat it. And they're like, haha, just kidding. Like, we've got it for you. And, and so, uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting to catch a wolf fish there before. For, and that was important because that's a new marine protected area. So it just goes to shows why that, you know, making sure there aren't too many ships and there's no nothing built in that area uh, because that's a now important habitat for a species that's at risk, that's in trouble. All right. And we have a few questions about icebergs and how big they are. Icebergs get very big, very, very big. Um, on some satellite imagery of uh, when I was on a ship one time, uh, on a ship off Baffin Island, there was a piece that broke off that was the size of Denmark, I think, um, that, you know, they come off an ice sheet into the ocean and chunks of the, of the ice break off and they get very, very big. Um, I don't see too many of them in the summertime. Usually it, they're not icebergs, but ice that's just uh, frozen ocean, like it's the ocean that's been frozen and broken up. Um, but occasionally you see little icebergs uh, and it's important not to set your net, your fish net when there's icebergs around, otherwise you're gonna lose your net. <laughs> All right, Miss Whitmax class asks, are there any fish in the Arctic that are vegan and only eat plants? Ooh, vegan fish. Um, not that I know of, but not not a species, but maybe a stage in their life. So Arctic cod are uh, a really important species in the Arctic. Just about everything eats them. Arctic char eat them, belugas eat them, seals eat them, narwhal eat them, uh, seabirds eat them. They're a really fatty little fish that's really, really important for the food web. And when they're little, uh, they, they lay their eggs under the ice and the little tiny baby Arctic cod live and eat the algae uh, that grows underneath the, the sea ice. Uh, so the baby Arctic cod are probably vegan, that they, they eat the algae that grows there until they get bigger and they can start to eat zooplankton. Um, it's part of the reason why we collect information right under the ice, because that's really important fish habitat. All right, and sort of leading off of that, what is the thickest measurement of ice you've seen? Ooh. Uh, so most of the measurements we do are in the coast on the ocean side. The ice gets thicker in the lakes, um, but 
it was, I think we had a measurement of about six feet for the thickness of the ice in one spot. Um, so that was quite large. Uh, my, those augers, those blades that we use to cut through the ice are only so big. So usually we're choosing areas where it's thick enough that we can cut through it, but not too thick. So. Interesting. Uh, Ms. DeCoster's class, do you have another question you'd like to ask? Um, nope. All right, Eden, what's your question? Have you ever got bit by a fish and what one? Have I been bitten by a fish? Yes, I have. <laughs> uh, I've been bitten by a few different fish. <laughs> they don't like it when they're being taken out of a fish net and they're flopping around and I'm trying to untangle them. Uh, I've The one that hurts the most uh, is called a pike, a northern pike. So they're a long, skinny fish with like big chunk, big sharp teeth. They eat a lot of different species. Um, I've been bitten by a pike before and but fortunately, I was wearing gloves. I wear uh, like scuba diving gloves when I am looking after the net. So even though it bit me, it didn't draw blood or anything. But the fish are usually aren't very happy with me when I'm pulling them out of the net. All right. Uh, Miss Whitmax class says they just looked up a picture of the wolf fish and are wondering if it's part of the same family as eels. Uh, it's eel-like, like it has the same body shape, um, but they're from different families. Uh, the wolf fish uh, are more, uh, like they're, they've got different fins al along the sides of their bodies uh, that are a little different than eels, um, but the way that they use their habitat and the way that their body is formed is very similar to, to an eel. All right. Um... We have this interesting question. Is it dangerous to cut open a salmon if it has a disease? Oh, very good question. Um, so that's another thing that we look at with the salmon coming in. We sample them for diseases. Um, it's uh, salmon and fish are so different than people that it's, it's very difficult for uh, a disease that a salmon might have to pass all the way to a mammal like us. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you were to eat it, uh, some of the parasites that are in the fish could cause a problem for, for people. So that's why it's so important to cook your fish because sometimes there can be parasites in the fish and cooking it is what prevents that from passing over. But as far as the local fish are concerned, we are looking at parasites like sea lice that could show up on the salmon and whether or not they could transfer to the native fish. And we're also looking at what diseases the fish or the salmon have that are coming in that could be of danger to the local fish. So. You don't have to worry about getting a salmon disease uh, as long as you cook your fish, um, but the native fish might be in trouble. All right, Ms. DeCoster's class, do you have another question you'd like to ask? Uh, Emma B, Emma B, come ask your question. What's your favorite fish to dissect? What's your favorite fish to dissect? I, I really like dissecting salmon. Um, Part of that is because I'm from Vancouver and I'm from the West Coast and I grew up uh, when I was in elementary school taking rearing the little salmon eggs and taking them to the hatchery and watching them go. Um, and now I get to study them as an adult. Uh, it kind of feels like I've gone through my salmon cycle uh, and I, I really like salmon. I think they're, they're a great fish to dissect and everything we collect from them is really interesting. All right, we have this super awesome question from Miss Whitmax class. Can you tell how old a fish is and how? Ooh, oh, that's a good one. I like I like that question a lot. Um, I didn't talk about it today, but one of the things that we collect from every single fish we catch is something, it's a little ear bone at the back of the fish's head and it's called an, an otolith. And the otolith, this little bone, it grows rings like a tree. And so for each ring of its life, we can count the rings and see how old the fish is. And we can even um, find out at what point in its life it moved between freshwater and saltwater. So with this tiny little bone that grows in the back of the head of the fish, um, it helps keep them balanced in the water. Uh, we can learn so much about the fish and how it spent its life and how old it is. All right, super cool stuff. So we have so many awesome questions. It's almost tough to sort through them all. Um, what is the most beautiful fish you've seen and why? Ooh, oh, I think they're all beautiful. I think they're all beautiful in their own way. Um, 
I, I think Arctic char, uh, the most popular fish to eat in the Arctic is beautiful. They grow um, beautiful spots all over their body. And when they start to spawn, they're, they're all kinds of different oranges and yellows. Um, I, and salmon too, sockeye salmon and chum salmon, when they start to spawn and they're ready to lay their eggs, they turn these beautiful colors. Uh, and those are just Arctic fish. Um, you know, I'm, as a naturalist, I'm interested in fish all over the world. And I think all the tropical fish are incredible. Um, I think, I think they're all beautiful. For sure. Um, we have this question. It might be kind of tough to answer because it seems like all aspects of your job are amazing, but what is your favorite part of your job? Uh, my favorite job, part of my job is working so closely with the Inuit and the Northern communities. Um, uh, a lot of what we do is setting up camp and spending time together and sipping tea and talking about the land. Uh, it's really an honor to work with these elders and people who've lived up in the Arctic for generations and have all these great stories and all these these uh, myths and legends that they talk about. And it's I, I've learned so much about the Arctic in a way that I'll, I never knew was possible by studying fish alone. Uh, so the, re the relationships that I've made up there is really important and the, the stories that I've got to hurt here are really special. For sure, that's super valuable. Um, we have, what is the smallest fish you've ever found? Smallest fish. Um, I've caught little baby fish, little larval, like baby sculpins or baby bullheads. Uh, our, the weather was really bad one day and we couldn't take our boat out to set a net. So we're, you know, we're in the tidal area wandering around seeing if we can put, pick uh, species of crab or invertebrates out of the rocks. And there were little tiny baby sculpins floating around. So we were able to scoop some of those up in a bucket and they're, they're really small. They're probably about as long as my thumbnail. So that was probably the smallest, the baby sculpins. All right, we have a few questions about whether you eat fish a lot or whether it's too closely related to work. I I love to eat fish. I they're it's one of my favorite foods and having fresh arctic char out of the ocean uh with uh, uh people who've been able to share them with us up in the northwest territories is really special and it's a really really important treat. Um also uh from the west coast I love eating Pacific salmon. Uh, it's nice to talk about it with other fishermen to, about the different flavors and even talking about how you eat it and how the flesh changes throughout the year is kind of a scientific question. You know, why is it that they're, they're more oily in the summertime than in the wintertime? So by just talking about some of that stuff, I end up doing science with the local fishermen. So I like to eat fish. I do too. <laughs> uh, Ms. DeCoster, do you guys have another question? Um, Emma Z. Emma Z. Why are they called wolffish? Good question. Uh, they're called wolffish because they've got they're they're aggressive hunters. They're like the little eel wolves of the sea. They've got big teeth and they're you know they don't have a lot of predators. Just like a wolf in the woods doesn't have a lot of predators. So yeah, that's why they're big predators and. They've got big teeth. All right, uh, so we're almost coming to an end of our event. I'll just ask two more questions. Um, we have a few questions about whether there's ever been scary moments or accidents that happened while you were working, like falling through the ice or anything. Um, thankfully, no. Uh, that's that's something that happens up north a lot. The, the Arctic is a really dangerous environment and it, it can change really quickly. Um, Fortunately, we've we've been very safe, and we never travel when the weather turns bad. But sometimes it changes faster than you than you can predict. Uh, so working with people who live out there is really important, and it helps keep us safe. Uh, there have been times where we'd be in we'd be in our camp, and the weather would change really quickly, and it it's really humbling, uh, and it's really important to respect how how serious the Arctic environment is. I've never fallen through the ice, but we train for that. Um, here in Winnipeg, we go through training where they t put us in a harness and we wear the equipment that we'd normally be wearing for field work. And we go to a winter rapid and they they drop us in the, the cold water and we've got to learn how to get out. Um, the most important thing to know in those that training is not to panic, uh, to catch your breath and 
you know, collect, collect your nerves and then, and then you climb out. Uh, but we go through a lot of training to make sure we stay safe. And fortunately, I haven't had to use any of that. All right, that's good to hear. So to cap it off, we'll ask one more question that we've had a few folks asking. Uh, how biodiverse is the Arctic and what different spe how many different species of fish are in the area? Ooh, I like that question. Um, the Arctic isn't as biodiverse as the tropics would be um, because it's so cold and the environment is so hard. Only a handful of species can stay up there and survive in that. So the environment really narrows the number of species that can survive. Um, but that being said, uh, in one of the areas that I work in, uh, in the coastal area and the freshwater area and then the offshore area, uh, there are about 60 different species of fish uh, that can overlap with one another. Uh, and then that's just fish alone. There's also all the little invertebrates, the zooplankton, the marine mammals. So when you look at the whole picture, there's actually, um, it's pretty rich in biodiversity. And by studying all of this, we get to help preserve areas that are really important and really biodiverse so that it stays that way. Um, so, so yeah, even though it's less than the tropics, it's still, still quite biodiverse. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we're coming to an end of our event. So thank you so much, Darcy, for joining us, teaching all, teaching us all about your important research and just how important community-led science is. And thank you to all of our classrooms, both from our classroom seats and folks joining in from YouTube for your amazingly insightful questions. So that is a wrap, everyone.